I've been playing Kunitsugami Path of the Goddess because you have no time to game. Before starting the review, let's get the basics out of the way. Kunitsugami was released on the 19th of July 2024 on PS4, PS5, PC and various Xbox consoles. It was developed and published by Capcom and took me roughly 12 hours to see the credits roll. Remember, only review a game once I've seen the end credits to try and lend some credence to my reviews, maybe. If you told me that in the year 2024 that a AAA developer would drop a game that wasn't 100% playing it safe, I'd have just had to make a call getting you admitted into one of those lovely rooms with padded walls and a jacket that keeps your arms snug. And yeah, Kanitsugami really, really isn't a safe bet. I honestly can't see it selling that well, and that's a real shame. But hey, it's on Game Pass. And even if you're only vaguely intrigued, go give it a go. That's kind of the TLDR of this uh, review. Just give it a try, see what you think. But anyway, what is a Kanitsugami, and why is it a Path of the Goddess? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Kanitsugami is set on the mountain called Mount Kafuku. Darkness has taken root and consumes the mountain. And all that now stands before it is the priestess of the mountain god and her spirit soldier, So. I think that's how you pronounce it. They don't really talk in this game much. They must work their way down the mountain bit by bit, freeing villagers and purging the defilement that has taken root. Or at least that's what I think is going on. Beyond the opening cutscene, very little said. But there is a lot of interpretive dance. Uh, honestly, though, I didn't feel like it needed a big grandiose story or anything like that. The setup and the dancing kind of gives you enough information. It's like, here's the goal, just go for it. The gameplay is really interesting, and I struggled to classify it. The best I could come up with was like an action RPG tower defense game. All right, don't panic. I know when tower defense is mentioned, a lot of people get turned off. They think balloons or the multitude of crappy games on Roblox or, or something like that. But hear me out. This game is a really interesting take on it. The game's divided into two elements, the battle mode and the development mode. In the battle mode, you have a day-night cycle in which you usually need to lead the priestess to the final gate and purchase the defilement. I should make it clear, we play as the guardian so, and not the priestess itself. To get the priestess to the goal, we're gonna need these crystal thingies to get her to move, and she doesn't move fast. As time slowly ticks on, getting to night, you're going to want to do things and you're going to wish you, she'd move faster. Okay, to get the crystals, we need to purge all sorts of doodads around the map. Or cut down these strange plants. While searching around the map as well, you'll also find animals to purge. They usually give you some rations, which is an item you use for healing. And villagers. Now the villagers are key to defending the priestess, and it's where the tower defence part comes in. When you first cleanse them, they're just a basic villager. But spending some of the crystals on them, you get to set them to a different class. All the classes have different abilities, and as you press, progress through the game, you'll unlock more classes. These abilities might be something like the woodcutter, who's your frontline fighter, or the marksman, who's a gun-wielding combatant, or the shaman, that acts as a healer, or the aesthetic, that slows down enemies and does like a magic attack. There's quite a lot of variety. There's more than I just mentioned. Also, during the day, you can have a thief, and they can go around and open up and dig up chests and stuff, but they don't actually take part in the combat at night, so you probably want to switch them to another class at that point. At a certain point in the game, you get a, per a permanent follower. He doesn't battle at night, but he is a builder. And he'll go around the map, and he'll fix up all sort of doohickeys um, to give you help during the night's battles. You'll make things like barriers, traps, cannons, and more. So while you're exploring around, you'll be managing him because he takes time to build the different things. So you're managing his time, you're managing the priestess is moving because you want to make sure she's in a safer place as possible for the night, while also making sure you get all the villagers and positioning the villagers where you want them. It's a lot to do with during the day. And on top of this, if you manage to find all the defiled spots, you also unlock a fancy new item. But yeah, night is drawing in and you need to command your troops. 
And like I said before, the villagers are where the tower defence comes in, as you'll position your villager, villagers to most effectively keep the priestess alive. She's kind of like the base of the tower defence game. And basically nothing else matters. If villagers die, you can just res them the next day. If so dies, he just comes back after a little bit of time. It's only the priestess that matters. So now that some time has passed and night falls, the evil, evil Seath start to pour out the gates to murderate the priestess for her sins or something. The Seath are interesting and have some really gribbly aesthetic to them. They're kind of what really makes the game unique and kind of disturbing. There's lots of fingers coming out of places that there just shouldn't be in faces that are just wrong and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those, you look at a trailer or look at whatever I've got on the screen and you'll, you'll start to see it. Their aesthetic is something different. Many of these you might not have seen before in anything. And anyway, as so, you have some simple tactics to defeat them. So you can do light or heavy attacks and a dodge. And he also has a block. Later on, he gains a couple more abilities like blow and bow and arrow to target flying enemies. But it boils down to just using the various combos. That's the bulk of the combat. You'll be dodging and then using your combos to murder as many of the seeds as possible. And once the seeds make it past you, they'll need to get past the traps, and then eventually they'll get into battle with your villagers, depending on how you position them. And it's going to happen. They're going to get near the priestess at some point, and then your villagers are going to fight. Because while early on in the games they tend to come out of one gate, later on they can come out of all sorts of different gates around the map. Some of them, so you'll be defending multiple angles and all sorts. And on top of that, the Seath also start wielding weird powers of their own. They can buff each other, they can shoot long distance things themselves, they can fly. It all gets quite hectic and it's actually great fun. If you survive the night, you get a bunch of crystal thingies to get your priestly girl moving as well. As defeating the enemies gives you even more crystal thingies. So that's the day night cycle and you'll be trying to get the priestess to get through gates. Sometimes there's multiple gates to get through and it'll unlock a new area each time you get through a gate. So more things to explore. Um, most of the, the, the turns are done in like two, three, four nights. But this isn't the end of what So can do. So we've got all that fighting, we've done all that exploring, but there are a couple of extra little tricks up his sleeve that tend to develop a bit further in the game. You get a special attack, which I didn't mention before. And you can actually unlock several of these, but you can take a max of three if you've unlocked the ability to take three. Um, and these could be like big flaming attacks or even buffing your villagers. So there's quite a variety on how you can, how you want to use so in battle himself. But these abilities do take time to recharge and they only recharge while you have them selected. So if you've used all three, only whichever one you've got selected at that current time is going to recharge. Now, at this point, it feels like I should be going on to say what happens after battle, but we aren't done yet. As not all the levels are so simple as enemies pouring out the gate and priesty girl moving towards the gate. And that's what I kind of first feared the game might be, is the first couple of levels are that way. But some levels, so doesn't even get to fight. And you have to entirely rely on your villager management. There are some that are in the dark and requires managing these lamps and all sorts. Some are on boats, so it's moving and the boats can be destroyed and all sorts. And then we get to the boss battles, which play out slightly differently in that other than just positioning your, your villagers, you can give them all out attack and all out defend commands. And the bosses will have their own unique mechanics. They're, there's quite a variety on how they work. Each one's different to the last one. And some of them will spawn enemies that will try and sneak past you and your, your villagers to get to the priestess. It's, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of gimmicks and a lot of variety. It, that's one of the things that generally surprised me about the game, the amount of variety. But yes, anyway, at a battle, we've purged the area. So it's time to rebuild the village using the villagers that you freed. And what do you get? For rebuilding the villages, you get rewards and upgrade points and random pieces of art and all sorts. Um, the building is actually very simple. It's it, They take a number of villages to rebuild and then you go out on a mission and they'll be done in one or two nights, depending on the building. 
There is a couple that are more annoying, as in around the map you'll find these little wooden blocks, and you have to get the villagers to pick those up first before they can go and build the thing. And obviously it's going to take a few nights to fully build up all the va all the buildings because you don't have enough villagers to build everything in one go. It's it's one of those things. It's quite nice. You get to see the village be built, but it could have just been done in the menu. <laughs> also, while you're running around a little map, don't forget, for the people that like it, you can pet basically all the animals. And I mean like anything, not just dogs and cats. You can pet snakes and deer and all sorts. But... Oh, you'll also be wanting to go and talk to your priestessy. It's in while talking to her that you can set up your things like your special attacks, and there's even a, a series of small buff items that you can use, and you can take several of them, like several have several of them equipped, making things like moderately buff your health or other weird and wonderful effects. But throughout it all as well, you'll be collecting something called Musabi. You get this from finishing missions, building certain buildings or finishing sec secondary objectives in battles, which I forgot to mention. When you complete a mission, you get to see all its secondary objectives. These can be doing it in a certain time, not getting hit, stuff like that. Um, so you can actually go back into a mission that you've previously done and try it again to get the secondary objectives. But anyway, you, that all gets you Musabi, which you're gonna spend on your villagers and eventually yourself and they basically everything has a kind of its own skill tree with increasing wasabi cost to go up it so my advice for this is fully upgrade your favorites so in my case for me i fully upgraded the shaman the aesthetic the marksman and woodcutter which is why i mentioned those ones previously because they were my favorites and they're what worked for me tactically um, and like I said, you'll also be upgrading so you can unlock the bow and arrow, you can unlock more special skill attacks or more items you can take with him, stuff like that. I'll admit, the building time mechanic was cool, but yeah, like I said, it could have just been menu driven. There's a lot of loading in and out of maps that felt a bit time consuming and would have cut down the time on the gameplay if it was just been done from the menu. But it's a really small negative, really. But anyway, you'll do this until each village is fully built up. You'll have worked your way down the mountain, and eventually, you go back. You fight back up the mountain and fight the final boss. It's a fun gameplay loop. <laughs> That's what it's, it was enjoyable. But as we always do, a quick look at Metacritic. It's currently sitting at eighty or seven point eight user score, which I think pretty much sums up the game. It's just good, solid fun. For me, the main reason I played it originally was because of the visuals. They were just so damn striking. And I just wanted to see what weird and gribbly things would be unleashed on me next. I honestly wasn't expecting the variety in gameplay and the addictiveness of the battle system to hit me the way it did. But damn, did I find it fun. It's really good to see a AAA company taking a punt on something so unique. Kind of takes me back to PS2 era in some ways. So I'm going to give the game a give it a go.